Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're joined by Patrick Caroline from Pacific University, and we're going to be speaking with Patrick about the history of myopia management on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. I'm here joined with my mentor, Patrick Caroline, back in around 2004, while I was doing my residency, Pauline Chu published her data showing a 50% reduction with orthokeratology, some things that we presumed to be the case, but Pauline really put the initial study on the map. And Patrick and I were standing in the reception area of the Pacific University Clinic, and Patrick said, with your wife doing pediatrics and you doing contact lenses, this is what you're going to be doing with your clinic in the future. And fast forward 15 years, here we are talking about that conversation. We're here talking about the explosion of myopia management. So Patrick, thank you for starting me off in the myopia management space. Uh, you're welcome, David. It was uh, some good times back then. <laughs> it was good times. So Patrick has been really involved with the contact lens industry for a very long time. We won't get into your very early days in, in, in the industry, but Patrick has been teaching and seeing patients uh, for a very long time and has entered into this perspective of being the historian and many things contact lenses. Uh, tell us a little bit about your passion for the history of contact lenses and what you and, uh, and um, Craig have yes. curated here. Well, uh, you know, I don't know where it came from, David. It uh, just uh, has been a passion of mine my entire life. You know, this, uh, you got to admit, the contact lens industry has been incredibly good to us. And um, one of the ways in which I could kind of um, sort of return some of that was uh, through the Contact Lens Museum. So a number of years ago, Craig and I got together. Uh, we had been collecting um, various uh, contact lens um, memorabilia for a long, long time and decided then to open a museum. It, uh, it's the first of its kind in the United States, uh, and uh, we're pretty darn proud of it. We get some, uh, some real industry first. We have the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. We have the only uh, apparatus uh, still around for making glass contact lenses. So. Uh, that uh, instrument is actually still working. We can fire it up and uh, still make glass uh, scleral lenses. So oh, wow. if, if you ever need one, uh, let me know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an opportunity to visit the museum in 2019. And boy, was it a treat. There's some real cool whoppers in there. And I'm just going to throw this out there. If anybody wants to give money to the museum, I'm sure Patrick would be, would be grateful for that. But also, you've discovered that so many people are about to throw away really valuable things, and they need to reach out to you. That is for sure. That uh, It always uh, breaks my heart when I hear of things being thrown out that really are kind of treasures for our industry. So yeah. uh, if you have anything that kind of falls into that category, please uh, reach out to either myself or Craig. And um, boy, we sure would love to uh, have it as part of the museum. Yeah, really slick. So speaking of this historical perspective, I was hopeful that you could kind of walk us through the history of controlling myopia. Tell us what the theories have been, what the products have been used for, uh, what the concepts have kind of been, 
And uh, I may interrupt you a couple of times to ask some questions, but I'd love for you to kind of share with us where we have come from to get us where we are today. Well, you know, this whole story of uh, myopia control is nothing new. I mean, it's been around for virtually centuries. Uh, Eye care practitioners trying to figure out why certain individuals are myopic. And of course, um, you know, genetics was always identified as uh, one of the major contributors. Uh, However, uh, today we know that that's not the case, Uh, that actually environment uh, plays a stronger role in the development of a young child's myopia in, uh, you know, 2021. So we're learning a lot, and uh, the study you mentioned was really the the first of its kind. It was the study that brought uh, myopia control to the forefront. Prior to that, Pauline's study, a lot of work had been done in the area of uh, bifocal and progressive aspheric spectacle lenses uh, that perhaps uh, by relaxing the accommodative mechanism, we could uh, control axial eye growth in children. However, all of the studies that were done in that arena basically showed pretty suboptimal results, maybe a a quarter or a half an diopter over a two year period. And it just didn't warrant uh, all of the uh, efforts involved by the parents to keep the child in those uh, spectacle lenses. And slowly but surely, uh, we started to learn a little bit about the role of orthokeratology in myopia control. Early on in the... I'm going to oh, go, go ahead. interrupt you for a minute. Please. I recall you telling me that in ancient days, they would use sandbags. Is that true? Now, now, now you're going way back in time. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, <laughs> That's it's, where you said centuries, right? Yes, yeah. right. Well, it, uh, it was uh, said, and, and we, we don't have any historical evidence of this at all. But uh, the fact that the ancient Chinese would uh, sleep with sandbags, small sandbags on top of the eyes, and would wrap a piece of gauze around their head to hold the sandbags in place. This would uh, present a subtle force to the eye and was said to have flattened the cornea. Now, We've never tried it because uh, it's just such a crazy idea, <laughs> but I guarantee you that in my lifetime, we will do that. Uh, we will um, get a group of first year optometry students who don't know any better, <laughs> and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try the old sandbag trick. There, I, we, there we go. I'm a well, little... I'm a little apprehensive. The uh, you know just the retropulsion of the uh, globe under that weight. I, I yeah. don't think we could be flattening the cornea at all. Well, but. that concept of flattening the eye had been something in even those early days of RGP wear. Yeah. The thought that maybe you know standard rigid gas permeable lenses, and then Jeff Walling's clamp study, I believe mm-hmm. it was, it was. Uh, kind of spoke to us about that. And, and, you know, what was, if, if you recall, what were, what did we kind of learn from that study? Well, uh, what we learned is that, um, you know, wearing a traditional alignment fitting RGP lens, not one that's flatter than the curve of the cornea, but an alignment fitting lens really had uh, no effect on uh, controlling myopia in children. There were two studies. Uh, There was the Walleen study at Ohio State and the CAT study at um, uh, Singapore uh, University. And both those studies came up with uh, virtually identical conclusions that uh, wearing an alignment RGP lens um, had little or no effect. Now, 
This was a little counterintuitive to many practitioners at the time, though, because uh, we kept hearing from patients. You know, Pat, I started wearing these lenses, you know, 20 years ago, and my myopia has not gotten any worse. It stopped the progression of my myopia. Now, you hear it once or twice, you just sort of shrug your shoulders, but when you hear it hundreds and hundreds of times, um, you're starting to wonder, is there something to that? Well, what we learned is there really isn't anything to it. Uh, they had just reached a age where their myopia had, had naturally or rather naturally stopped progressing at the same rate. And, uh, you know, they uh, just experienced this euphoria of, uh, mm -hmm of uh, the, the uh, contact lenses being uh, the reason for their um, myopia I think, stopping. I think you're right, is that they, they became myopic enough that somebody finally said, we're going to put you in rigid lenses. Well, mm -hmm. they probably had advanced into their later teen years and their progression yep. had really slowed at that point. So before I rudely interrupted you, you were entering into the arena of orthokeratology so I'll let you pick up right there. So we, we've come upon ortho -K. Yeah, we did. And, you know, it really had a uh, resurgence in the, the 1960s. Now, these were just spherical contact lenses that were fitted uh, about a diopter and a half flatter than K. Uh, these lenses resulted in kind of a minimal amount of um, change in the cornea. It did flatten the cornea, but the maximum effect you could get uh, was really uh, around one diopter of corneal flattening. And so there were some tremendous limitations to that modality. But uh, then all of a sudden, uh, in 1962, George Jesson uh, came out with a new idea related to orthokeratology, and that was his orthofocus design. And uh, what it was, it was a primitive, at best, uh, reverse geometry lens design. But uh, it really ignited, uh, and uh, all of a sudden in the mid-1980s, we saw this incredible proliferation of patents and designs coming out related to reverse geometry lenses. And by the 1990s, they had uh, really matured pretty well. Um, not that different from the designs we're actually using today in clinical practice. So uh, the reverse geometry designs have been around uh, with us for a long time. Now, I, uh, I, I know that Paragon, you know, gained some real, uh, some real big credibility because they got this FDA approval. I think that was around 2001. Well, hey, very remember. good. Yeah. That's amazing. But, yes, that's it. <laughs> but, um, but prior to that, we had people all over the place designing lenses, night move lens. I think that was uh, mm -hmm. Roger Tab right there in Portland, Oregon. Correct. We had, uh, you know, um, the context lens. There's so mm -hmm. many. I, I can't. I, I don't want to begin mentioning all of them. There were so many. But um, but re the reverse geometry lenses utilized for orthokeratology. Tell us about those early days. It seemed like there was just a small group of people really doing that. What was the concept of fitting orthokeratology like back in those days? Um, topography wasn't what it is today. Uh, you know, who's going to get into this process? It seemed very complicated. Uh, it really was. And unless you had someone holding your hand and guiding you through it, uh, you would be pretty lost. Um, I had the great fortune of uh, my mentor, Roger Kami. Uh, he was the one that took my hand and uh, brought me into the fold of this uh, crazy group of individuals that were fitting orthokeratology <laughs> then. And uh, we had no concept of uh, myopia control as it relates to ortho -K. 
we were just doing it because it was quite fascinating to see the cornea changing uh, beneath these lenses in a, uh, in a more predictable fashion than what we had with our spherical lens designs. So that was in the 80s, 90s, the reverse geometry coming out in the 90s. Correct. What, uh, what, what was the kind of process here to get to, hey, maybe this is slowing down myopia? Why, you know, it wasn't, uh, maybe she was, Pauline, the first to kind of come to this realization. But as I recall, there were a lot of people who perceived this concept of slowing down myopia where, where was that kind of in the back of people's minds with myopia management? Because it was police officers and firefighters and people mm -hmm. trying to pass these, you know, getting their, their vision passed as being 2020 without correction that yeah. uh, we're using it kind of at first. So where did yeah. that kind of come about for myopia and children? Well, you know, that came about uh, as does all good science. I always tell the students, all good science begins in one place, and it's not the lab. It is in clinical practice. You get these uh, groups of practitioners that uh, have these impressions, and that's what they are. They're just clinical impressions that uh, they fitted this group of young individuals, and all of a sudden, their myopia dramatically decreased. And uh, there's no controlled studies. There's uh, no uh, evidence-based uh, data to support it. And it's only through those observations that people like Pauline Cho then make the next uh, step into the uh, controlled clinical trials. So um, again, everything that has ever been special in my life has always started in the clinic. The idea, the genesis, the seed has been planted in the clinic. And I think we kind of underestimate, uh, we always underestimate the uh, impact uh, the clinicians have on, uh, you know, uh, evidence-based science. Uh, it all begins somewhere and it's definitely in the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very true. Um, so we, we, we came into this realization, then this world of atropine and this world of the, uh, the, the atom studies and the lamp studies and multifocal soft contact lenses started to have this, this surge, right? The early studies mm -hmm. with multifocal soft contact lenses were all over the place, right? right. Orthokeratology, the studies have kind of shown about the same level of myopic reduction, about mm -hmm. 40 to 60, 70%. Um, but with regards to soft multifocals, I remember some of those early days, there was distant center, near center studies that were coming out. Mm -hmm. There was 20%, there was 50, 60% improvement, depending on the study. Walk us through a little bit of how these kind of things came to the realization and maybe even the uh, understanding of uh, what we believe to be happening in the peripheral retina that led to an understanding of lens design being what it is. Well, Dave, you bring up a good question related to the role of soft contact lenses or multifocal soft contact lenses. And that's really all built on that peripheral defocus story. And uh, it's um, still today the story that we base most of our communication with the parents uh, on is the fact that we, through the optics of the ortho-K or the multifocal soft lens, uh, we're creating this uh, myopic deep focus, uh, or we're changing uh, the, the optics of the eye in such a way that uh, it sends a signal to the eye to stop growing. Now, it sounds like a, a pretty good rap, uh, but we don't really know if any of that stuff is true. Uh, <laughs> the actual mechanisms as to how ortho K works, as to how multifocal soft lenses work, is still you know completely unknown. 
And uh, we know it works. We've got studies to support that, but the actual kind of neurotransmitting mechanism, you know, what chemicals are being altered in the eye or is it just plain optics? Is it uh, myopic defocus? Is it spherical aberration? Uh, there are so many things going on when we create these center distant, uh, you know, a peripheral near type of optics that um, it's going to be probably three to five years down the road uh, before we really understand the mechanisms of myopia control. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not going to slow mm -hmm. us down at all. We're going to continue to move forward as a community. Our patients don't have the luxury of waiting for us to understand these mechanisms. But um, once we do, Dave, once we understand these mechanisms, what's actually happening on, uh, you know, on a, a molecular level, uh, Mm -hmm. you're going to see this industry explode. Then we yeah. will be able to yeah. really focus our therapies much better than mm -hmm. we are right now. Right, right. Well, it seems like these stepwise approaches, right, with uh, maybe this higher amount of spherical aberration, like uh, the Volt study and that, uh -huh. uh, you know, our good friend Randy Kojima was really helpful on uh, the higher amounts of spherical aberration, the higher doses of atropine, maybe the higher ad power um, is we're understanding those sort of things. We in, in, you know, having a conversation with a Vanderwerp about this and customizing our treatment for different patients, depending on maybe what they are needing and what they're having. I, I couldn't agree with you more. That's a, that's kind of an exciting area. Now, you were, I think, one of the first to bring atropine to my awareness, um, and uh, we learned some things with atropine uh, over time. Do you want to give us a little bit of a rundown from uh, a historical perspective of atropine and myopia management? Yeah, atropine uh, first came into the literature in around 1962, and it was a uh, Dr. Bedrosian, uh, actually a um, ophthalmologist here in the Pacific Northwest, who published the first uh, paper on uh, the use of atropine for myopia control. And mm -hmm. once again, the whole concept was uh, again related to relaxing accommodation. So while the principle is probably not correct, the actual use of the atropine uh, and whatever it is doing uh, to, the, uh, to the eye uh, was real. And here again, uh, uh, not understanding the mechanisms, but understanding the results was really uh, what brought that to the forefront. Um, today, uh, we're still a bit in the dark as to how atropine works. It's uh, kind of like aspirin for the eye. You know, how does aspirin work? Well, a lot of theories, but uh, again, the definitive mechanism is still up in the air. And that, that's definitely the case, uh, too, with atropine. Yeah, but uh, yeah. we do know now uh, a few things about it that it is uh, that its results related to myopia control are dose related. As the dosage goes up, the myopia control gets better. As the dosage goes down, the myopia control gets worse. Mm -hmm. So. We can start looking at atrophy, and I think this is important that we do this as a community. Uh, we, start, we have to start looking at atropine like we do any other uh, pharmacologic, um, systemic, or uh, you know, ocular type of medication. Uh, as long as the individual is on the medication, they get a, a pretty good myopia controlling effect. But as soon as the uh, medication is withdrawn, like any other medication, uh, the condition returns. So one of the criticisms of um, atropine has always been this rebound effect. 
well, yeah, it, it's a criticism, but it's a drug. And like any anti-glaucoma drug or uh, blood pressure medication, um, it, when you withdraw treatment, um, the condition's going to worsen. So we have to start, you know, thinking about atropine in that regard and um, use it wisely as a, uh, a preventative thing. Uh, I think what we're going to find in the future is uh, something AFID probably discussed with you. And that is we're going to have to just start customizing our treatments for each individual patient. The idea that we can take a mycite lens or orthokeratology and put it on every patient and uh, get a specific response, well, it's not going to happen. Uh, each individual needs to be treated uh, individually. Uh, their response uh, is going to be totally different from the next patient. And until we come to that realization, uh, we're going to hover around that 50% uh, myopia reduction. When we start customizing treatments uh, for each individual, I really do believe uh, we're going to see some pretty extraordinary numbers. And yeah. uh, this has always been, you know, kind of my criticism of evidence based. Um, uh, decision-making in clinical practice. Um, when studies are done, they are done with a very, very strict protocol. That is, if uh, I put a patient into orthokeratology in a particular study and the child's myopia continues to worsen over the next two years at a kind of an alarming rate, it's pretty clear that that therapy is not working for that individual. Now in clinical practice, if I saw these changes taking place in six months, I would withdraw therapy and go to something else. And uh, that's just what you do in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. But in clinical trials, you can't do that. You can't customize the treatment for the individual. So right. it could be that our evidence-based numbers are actually lower than what, what you could anticipate in a, in, a, in a practice that uses all the different myopia control tools. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is, I really do believe that you need to have orthokeratology. If you're doing myopia control, you need uh, the uh, uh, multifocal soft lenses, the spectacles, the atrophy, yeah. and uh, you need to be using all of these treatments because there's going to be a cohort of patients that are just not going to respond to one given therapy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's very well said is that the, uh, the continuum is really where we need to be placing our emphasis and, uh, and, and just like we would in clinical practice is improve upon the treatments that each of the different patients are getting. And mm -hmm. um, Patrick, I thank you so much for sharing with us a little bit about the background of these treatments, the background, the history of myopia management. I knew there was uh, Nobody that I'd rather hear it from, uh, but my mentor. And so the old guy. I appreciate it. Yes. yes. Thank <laughs> you everyone a lot, for David. joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. If you'd be so kind, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star review. Uh, and also make sure to subscribe so you can hear other episodes of the Myopia Podcast in the future. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.